Um, yep, thanks uh, for letting me talk at a conference that I helped organize, a bit of bias there, I think. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk more generally about, um, about uh, phenomenological modeling and the type of models that Bruno was just discussing. Um, I tried to put, fit as many puns into the title because I know Neil <laughs> likes pod based puns, so that's for you. <laughs> So uh, just to a quick overview of the talk, I'll give a brief introduction to the progression of neurogenetic disease modeling. Um, I think Bruno's covered that quite well. Um, he focused on continuous models. I'll also discuss discrete models. Um, so that's the next thing I'll look at is types of disease progression model. Uh, and then types of data, because uh, it's, you know, they they need each other models and data, and then uh, look at the question of uh, continuous or discrete modeling, um, as to which type of model might be appropriate at which times. And I very much encourage discussion around that. I think everyone has their favorite type of models. Um, and then I have a shameless plug of a recent model that I've developed, which I'll show some initial results of. Uh, and then more of a sort of high level um, discussion at the end about what the future could look like for disease progression modeling. So this is, as, as I see it, um, uh, what pond modeling is in terms of the problem setting. Um, so I think it's that we want to learn useful, so clinically useful in information from partially observed data. Uh, so this is information that we wouldn't necessarily be able to get at just directly looking at the data that we have. Um, but then also considering the nature of medical data, which are often partially observed. We don't really follow people across their whole disease trajectory for a number of reasons um, and can also be missing uh, for other reasons that are not just at random. So uh, interesting that Bruno's talk there completely did away with it, hidden information. So um, you're going to see that I'll depart from his approach um, quite early on. And I'm going to focus on what I think of as on modeling, which is linked with trying to extract this hidden information. Uh, so I've got a simple picture here of um, what a pond model, pond type model might do which is taking observations on the left graph, which are observing, say, multiple observations from individuals um, over a given uh, period of time, say, uh, an observational study. And if time was on the horizontal axis there, then they'd all be, all these trajectories, if you like, would be on top of each other. Uh, so the pond model is this arrow with this mapping function um, in this case, it's just a scalar mapping of time. What it does is it shifts people around and gives you this uh, piece together trajectory um, in the, uh, the graph on the right. Um, so yeah, so in this case, it's, it's some sort of scalar time warping or shifting. Um, I was sort of thinking during Bruno's talk whether there was actually similarities with what you were doing in terms of with both approaches are looking for some sort of mapping. Yours was a vector field mapping, and this is just a scalar mapping, um, but different approaches. So the type of information that we might be trying to obtain using our models, uh, you can think of it in terms of whether it's group level or individual. Um, what, what most models do is, is, is um, abs uh, try and obtain this absolute time axis. Uh, which has come up a few times today in uh, in the talks. So trying to shift people onto some sort of common um, time axis. And then at the individual level, um, we, we can obtain information such as the stage, so the position along that axis for each individual, uh, subtypes and uh, rates of progression. And we do that using our disease progression models, which tend to be statistical and machine learning methods. Uh, so this is just uh, another picture of what disease progression models, um, kind of how they work. 
So they learn patterns of disease related changes in data. So we put some data into our learning methods and we get disease progression model there. Easy, end of talk. Um, so what's quite nice about the models is that the data can be of any type. So we can use lots of different modalities and imaging, non-imaging, genetic data, uh, biofluid data. And the only requirement really is that these um, data are dynamic. So they change in time or else we wouldn't be learning very much. So now getting on to types of disease progression models. So I think there's a lot of ways that you could actually categorize them. Uh, but I'm just going to focus on um, whether they're uh, your the, the, the model that you apply to your data um, learns a continuous time shift or a discrete time shift. Uh, so the, the types of models that I can think of that go into each of those categories in the continuous time models, you've got lots of different types of mixed effects models, um, typically have some sort of time reparameter reparameterization mapping function, differential equation models, Gaussian processes, and then going into like deep learning uh, regression neural networks. So for discrete time shift models, so this is when you're moving people along your time axis and they're, they're, they're given stages or, or discrete times along this axis, um, as opposed to continuous time, which just provides you a continuous shift. Um, you have uh, typically Markov models historically been used, um, event-based models uh, more recently, particularly our group works with them a lot, and then um, different types of deep learning models such as recurrent neural networks, reinforcement learning. So they each have their positives and negatives. This could get, you know, we could get argumentative quite quickly about this, I'd imagine. Um, but I guess that's part of the spirit. So I've just picked one positive and negative uh, that I can think of from each. So for the continuous models, it, they probably they probably reflect our own experience um, of, of time, if you like, uh, more, more naturally. Um, so they, they naturally model continuous observations, um, which, uh, depending on the application that you have, could be quite relevant to your data. But the drawback is that there is some sort of interpolation that is performed uh, by your model, for example, in regression. And that interpolation may actually go beyond the resolution of your observations. So you may your model might be giving you information at a resolution in time that is actually higher than the data that has been used to, uh, to fit the model. Um, so you, you could get a false idea of um, how accurate the predictions are. In terms of discrete models, um, one of the benefits is that you can naturally structure your data using the discretization, which can be quite useful under certain circumstances, uh, but you, you lose information um, when you do this discretization. So then the question of which type of model you use, uh, ultimately both can be used for modeling medical data. And I think that the choice depends on what it is that we want to estimate, um, or at least it partly depends on that. So we've got the jack curves appearing again, it's gonna be a home run for, for that by the end of today, I think. Um, so if we wanted to model biomarker trajectories, such as those hypothetical curves, the um, continuous models most naturally lend themselves to that, I think. You can do it with discrete models, but I think it's, it's the most obvious approach. Um, conversely, for the uh, discrete models, clinical stages tend to be discrete. Um, so just an example, recent staging model, uh, the ATXM model in Alzheimer's disease, uh, provides different discrete stages. So if we're wanting to compare stages between our models and uh, clinical practice, um, or provide stages that are perhaps more interpretable to clinicians, then discrete models may be uh, more suitable. Uh, so the other thing that the uh, choice depends on is the type of data. So if you have high resolution temporal data, then I think continuous models make sense. You might as well use them because you have the data to support them. 
Um, on the other hand, if you have low resolution temporal data, so you're observing people fairly infrequently, then discrete models might be more suitable because you can structure your model uh, to the temporal resolution that you have in your data. I'm just showing two graphs here. We have continuous trajectories on the top and an example of a visualization of how these discrete models, such as a Markov model might work is that they're like snapshots across the trajectory. So then um, putting these two considerations together uh, as in terms of the type of data that we have and the type of disease regression model that we might want to use. So this matrix here of uh, types of data on the rows and the type of model on the columns and some examples of each. Um, there are more examples and I'm sure I've missed some out. So I just the main ones that came to mind I put in here. Um, I hope that one one day, by the way, I hope to do this talk and have a random choose your own adventure type <laughs> point from here where you pick one of the quadrants of the matrix and we, we talk about that type of model. But as I said, I'm going to be a bit biased and pick my own model here and talk about that. So um, in terms of, for example, if you only have cross-sectional data, um, we have quite a lot of evidence and publications around using the event-based model and its variants, such as the discriminative EBM, and then um, Alex's uh, relaxation of the single event sequence uh, to create a sustain. And these models work very well just using cross-sectional data to obtain um, these templates of disease progression. Uh, I don't know of any examples of um, the longitudinal models in the bottom left corner that uh, have been applied to uh, cross-sectional data. Um, but I think technically any time reparameterized model can be applied to cross-sectional data uh, because you are providing this time shift um, along the x-axis. In terms of longitudinal data, um, there are examples using Gaussian processes and mixed effects models, quite a lot of literature on that, quite well established, including from uh, Bruno here. Um, and then in terms of discrete models, uh, hidden market models have historically been used. And more recently, um, the development of the temporal EBM, which we've been working on here in Pongru. Uh, so I'll just give a quick bit of background on why we developed the temporal EBM. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the event-based model, um, it's, uh, it's a discrete model of disease progression. It can learn the sequence of events um, using any cross-sectional data. And it's got a lot of positives. It's data-driven, uh, it doesn't require thresholds. It gives you some uncertainty. Uh, you can model any type of dynamic biomarker. And as I said, it only needs cross-sectional data. Um, but in that assumption, uh, there were some drawbacks. And that's that it assumed that events were either abnormal or normal, um, or that the, um, there was a single sequence of events so across the whole population. And Alex addressed these um, assumptions in our sustained paper. Yeah. And uh, yeah, one of the drawbacks of it uh, being able to only use cross-sectional data is that it couldn't provide any timing-based information. So we couldn't learn the time between the events and the sequence. And we couldn't uh, make predictions of individual level trajectories. So I don't have any maths in these slides, but I do have some graphs just to show the difference between the two models of how we went from the EBM to the temporal EBM. So the EBM is a generative model, and the observations that we have, which are shown in the box Y, are generated by these your, your latent stage or hidden stage along your trajectory, which is shown by K. Um, and your stage is generated by this sequence of events. So to translate that to the temporal setting, we added in this additional um, 
variable Q, which generates longitudinal measurements. Um, and the main idea really actually came from in market models. So in terms of um, how the model works, similarly to the EBM, the first step is to fit biomarker distributions of uh, healthy and unhealthy um, populations, uh, samples. Um, and then we learn the model parameters, so the sequence of events and the time between them um, using nested um, expectation maximization. And then putting uh, our learned variables together, we can get a, an ordering of biomarker abnormality and then a time between them and then a measure of uncertainty in that timing, uh, which is what we have in step three here, um, where the ordering the biomarkers uh, going from first to last, going from the bottom to the top on the y-axis, and then the times along the x-axis. So just showing some um, uh, initial results, uh, not peer reviewed in case you couldn't read that. <laughs> um, this is in AD using ADNI, uh, where we put in some a mix of different markers going from CSF, um, amyloid beta, PET amyloid beta, um, tau and phosphorylated tau from CSF, and some structural imaging volumes, clinical test scores, and then some more structural um, imaging volumes. And we, we get quite an interesting um, pattern here where you can see that certain um, events are occurring very close to each other, such as the uh, amyloid beta markers, the tau markers, and then some of the cognitive markers. Uh, we did uh, the same trick in Huntington's disease. We picked a, a smaller set of markers, the data set was smaller, and also to compare to one of their models that was published recently. Um, we found early changes in the subcortex, which is expected, followed by motor score and functional and cognitive changes. And there's something else we can do with the model. So once it's trained, um, we have this, this template of uh, disease progression. We can then take new data and uh, from just a single measurement, we can put it into the model and the model will give us um, a number that says how likely people are to progress along the sequence and over a given time frame. So this is, I actually just added this slide this morning based on Beck's talk. Um, because one of the things that she said that was interesting that we'd like to do is separate slow from fast progressing groups to try and enrich clinical trials, um, with the idea being that if we preferentially selected faster progressing people, then we would see a larger effect size over a shorter period of time. Uh, so we've done simulations um, of clinical trials, uh, comparing two cases where you either randomly select a cohort or you select it using the TEBM, um, and you say, well, people that are above a certain probability of progressing, we'll include them because they, they're fast progressors, and people that are below that threshold, uh, we don't include them in the trial. And comparing like, like between uh, these two sets of simulations, um, uh, we see that the, the TEBM can improve power by um, roughly so anyway, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you go back to the slide? Yeah. So we can interpret um, here. But uh, how many subjects do you have? Because I think uh, in the one that are the very fast progressor, like is there even a few subjects that remain that could be in this group? Uh, so how many? Okay. Fast progressors were selected. Select. Okay. So so say if I understand correctly, you, you select uh, the one that are. Uh, um, you know, like the, the most stringent uh, case, so like a uh, percent ideally. So this is the one for which the power would be the larger. But then, uh, hey, uh, you know, would it be easy to find this kind of subject? Say for a given cohort, I mean, can, can you actually find subject like that? So I believe you can. <laughs> yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a good question. So the question is, can you find people that are progressing that quickly? Um, so in ADNI, applying this selection criteria, so uh, the test set that I used, I 
was about 600 people. And out of those 600 people, it selected 120. Okay. So about it's one in five um, class progressives. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, now, so going back from the TUDM and going back to just talking more generally, um, got different ideas for the future uh, of this type of modeling. I think a no brainer is combining with TBM sustain. Um, then we get longitudinal subtypes. But sort of moving away from the TBM and maybe discrete models, um, I was thinking about potential collaborations uh, from COM22. And I'm really interested in comparing continuous and discrete models, cat ball style, basically. So not just trying to, you know, predict, well, not just, I mean, that's really difficult what cat ball is trying to do, but instead of uh, trying to predict some outcome measure or something like this longitudinally, um, using any type of approach, specifically just looking at disease progression modeling and looking at continuous and discrete models and trying to really get at this question of, because we're, we're all publishing different models all the time. And it's like, oh, this, my model's the best, my model's the best. It's like, well, actually, what we're really trying to do is just find the best model for the, the task. Um, and also, when the models break, because then I think that will help guide us in the future as to where we should develop. And also the question of whether, you know, it's, it's not either or, whether we should be combining them in some way. And then whether we can go forward and establish just a, a general methodology for doing you know, these types of, uh, this type of modeling. And then looking even further forwards, um, and Sarah is going to be talking about this in the afternoon session, is um, the question of, of how we go beyond just this descriptive phenomenological modeling of disease progression, um, and really trying to dig into uh, what's going on underneath and what's causing these observations to happen. Um, so causal inference in the presence of hidden confounders, which is something we have in medical data, it's, it's a really big uh, problem. Uh, a lot of people work on that, it's very difficult. How we integrate that into disease progression models? I don't know. Um, and then the other thing that we'd like to do is integrate these phenomenological models with mechanistic models. Uh, as I said, Sarah is going to be talking about that later. It's a really exciting talk. And I think that the same questions will arise there as well. So, uh, continuous and discrete modeling um, of both the phenomenological and mechanistic skills. So, very happy for questions and discussions. Thanks for watching. Well, the standard model not to do. So, we're, that's because I've written on as well. We're going to replace the jack curves with a point of signature. I'm looking forward to it as well. So, thank you. <laughs> Okay. okay. So, so um, with the typical in the end, it looks like we had a couple in with the caveat that they're not peer reviewed results. We had a couple um, biomarkers in HD and, and um, 80 that were kind of like the very first biomarker. Is, is that sort of a key assumption that you kind of have to identify the first biomarker? How often is there an issue if they're kind of competing biomarkers and which ones have the first? Yes. So the question is in these um, plots that you can see. The uh, question is how dependent is the model on the first biomarker that goes wrong? So in this case, it's CSF, amyloid beta, and in HD is the putainment. So what actually happens there, and you can see it in this plot, is that it, it thinks, the model thinks that CSF, A beta, and PET A beta basically occur at the same time. And that's because it's uncertain about the ordering of it. So that's what, what happens. If, if there is uncertainty about the ordering as to which marker goes wrong first, then it will place them very close together. And just, just one other thing that it looks like that FISA form has like super tiny comments. So do you have any idea what's going on there? Yeah, so again, that's because the FISA form and the mid temporal are very close together. They're occurring very close together. So the, the uncertainties there are basically interchangeable. Shared interchangeable. Yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, the first uh, selected biomarker was doesn't get an uncertain information. 
then yeah i mean it's you're, you're right in these figures it doesn't happen on certainty um i could include it because there is the model includes no event there is a time from that until that occurs but not not quite thought how to do that because no event type of course interpret yeah decided to but there might be some information in that that's the thing the model does give you a time from when all the markers are normal to the first one becoming out of normal gives you a time but then what that time actually means yeah exactly alex said some people may never have but yes yeah um i have a high level question uh which is okay yeah. so you you've shown um how uh possibly this kind of modeling can help for enrichment uh, do you think there is also a possibility that this model can contribute in uh, choosing a good clinical outcome? Uh, you know, just one that would be of interest and predictable, in a sense, where uh, uh, our analysis, one of the strengths of our analysis is to show values. And uh, possibly we could help choose uh, outcome, you know, better outcome. That would be uh, 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 that would be uh, easier to predict, and they might be multi-value but uh, mm. So Bruno's question was um, related to so the model is able to provide some sort of benefit for clinical trial, but then whether it would be able to provide predictions of outcome. Yeah, or help us to choose some outcome uh, that would be better. So in terms of design of it. All right. Okay. So yeah, actually, yeah. So whether the models can be used to help um, choose or provide a different endpoint. So it could be model stage or waste of time or some combination of the inputs to the model based on variance explained. Yes, I mean something that is predictable because if you look, I mean, we often say, hey, you know, that that you know the people in the physical world, you know, kind of. Uh, uh, they define what is the endpoint, but maybe we have a whole work there because if there is a lot of uncertainty on certain clinical outcomes like CDR summer process, we can maybe convince that hey, this is not the right thing to look at, and maybe you will be fine. And, and by using our model, find some uh, 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 markers that will be relevant or could be useful, but uh, for cognitive point of view, I mean, basically, but at the same time. Uh, would be easier to predict, and if you reduce the variance, then you're going to improve the problem. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, it's a good question. From um, from my perspective, I think that we should be moving in that direction. But then it's the question of um, the from the clinical perspective. I think presenting, you know, some sort of computationally derived metric. Saying, oh, use this instead of using this well established clinical test score might be quite hard. So, sure. So, uh, go, going through those steps probably takes, yeah, would take a bit of time. Um, but I agree that it's related to this, to the clinical trial result, because there I've just said, oh, okay, we've got some metric, we use that. Would that ever actually get used for a clinical trial? Again, it's just a question of you know, trying to validate it in some way, I think, that people have confidence. Hi, thank you for this talk. Very, very good. So, I'm interested in which model, which data, and something is not quite clear for me. So, we have really um, fantastic longitudinal data that go up to 20 years, let's say. But then, is there a model that can deal with the different treatments that the patients have in between all these? I mean, and I'm thinking from translating something like this to cancer. There's no way, like, they have so many different treatments, even in a very small cohort uh, or in a big cohort, every patient, because they have a say, they have so many treatments differently that they will affect obviously the biomarkers differently. So, which model for that kind of data? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. Laura was asking about. Um, what model could be used, what disease regression model would be used that accounts for treatment? Um, yeah, I don't think any of these models, but it's the short answer. Uh, it's something that needs to be developed 
Uh, you can imagine ways that you could integrate it into the EVM uh, or the temporal EVM. So I think you need time in there because there needs to be a before and after the treatment using only cross-sectional data, I don't think it would work. Um, so I think you need a longitudinal model. Uh, I think there is quite a lot of work that's been done. So I didn't mention these types of models, but in other groups um, using deep learning and, and other just sort of more predictive approaches where they use some sort of causal modeling. So that is quite popular at the moment for predictive treatment response. Um, that's, yeah, that's kind of what I was touching on at the end of the talk that we should be sort of moving towards is integrating some sort of causality in there of which one process would be administering the treatment. But not, sorry, just to clarify, I'm not interested in finding treatment yeah. towards, you know. Yeah, yeah, the, the effect of the treatment. The effect. Yeah, yeah you, would, you would have to account for it. Yeah. yeah. Find that. It's the beauty of these generative dynamic systems models, the differential equations that Bruno mentioned. We get out a parameter in there that simulates the treatment effect on any given one of those components of the vector field, and then you can predict what happens because we've got a generative train model of what happens. It, you know, once we get access to the data from pharma to actual interventions and actual consumers, learn those parameters as well. The intervention. At the moment, harder to do. whether functional changes, whether, well, yeah, so I haven't put functional changes into this model. Um, presumably it would go near the end. Uh, I, I just kind of selected these markers because um, based on the literature, I thought they were interesting, but I guess the functionality is really important as well. It is in the, the HD analysis. That's what the TFC is in Huntington's. Um, that's functional, total functional capacity. Um, and there's quite the, the recent, as I said, there was a recent publication that showed that actually cognition changes after becomes abnormal after functional um, capacity in HD. And uh, so we recapitulated that here. Um, but I agree it would be useful to have in the uh, Alzheimer's analysis as well. For HD, uh, track HD. I think that's one more question of the overall system. Um, yeah, I think it's very important to understand that the 